Hey everybody, Ed Holmwood, Old Guy Hi-Fi Channel. I hope everyone's doing well today. Today we're going to look at a couple of cool little mono blocks from IEMA, the A70 Monos. They're really kind of fascinating little devices, so sit back, relax, and we're going to talk about these fun little mono blocks. So the IEMA A70 Mono, interesting little amplifiers, little mono blocks. They're really actually quite nice. So they're based on the Texas Instruments 3255 chipset. They do offer the option of uh, swapping op amps, and I did do that. It comes standard with the Texas Instruments um, NE5532s, which is a very, very common kind of ubiquitous op amp. I tried a couple different ones. They're rated at 300 watts by into four ohms by the manufacturer with the supplied 48 volt five amp power supply, which I'll talk about in a second because it's got an interesting feature to it. Um, Audio Science Review tested it and they got an honest 80 watts into eight ohms and an honest 152 into four ohms. So I'll believe that. Um, has uh, real good distortion ratings of 0.01%. Um, ASR did recommend the amp, so they measured it and it did very, very well. Um, it's kind of an interesting little amp. It's very pretty, I think, with the, especially with the gold tone knobs. But let's take a quick look at the front panel. Let me turn them off here real quick. And what we've got on the front is obviously power on off. And it actually, when it's in the power on mode, it can be auto sensing. So if it doesn't detect a signal after a period of time, it'll shut itself off. This is subwoofer. If you want to use it as a subwoofer, you'd switch on the bottom to turn it into a sub amp for passive subwoofer. This allows you to control the frequency um, anywhere between 40 and I think 400 hertz on the uh, frequency for that. Volume control, and then whether or not you want RCA or XLR input, because it's got balanced on the back. So on the back, we've got balanced. We've got a single-ended input. We've got um, a 6 dB, sorry, 6 dB boost for the RCA input. Because remember, single-ended is, excuse me, single-ended is usually two volts. Balanced is usually four volts. So this gives you a boost. It has subwoofer base management built in. So it's got a line level sub out and you can control the crossover frequency between 40 and I think 400 Hertz, 12 volt trigger, speakers out, power in. And it does come with a 48 volt, five amp power supply, which I actually think is great because it's a GAN FET um, or a GAN gallium nitrate power supply. But look how small it is for 40 volts. Most of the time they're much larger than this. So this is a lot easier to live with. It's really, really nice. So it's got some great features in it. We're going to talk about it when we look inside. Um, it does use a, a technology called post-filter feedback technology, which is really interesting to reduce distortion. And again, I'll talk about that a little bit more while we're looking inside. So let's do this. Let me go over. We'll put it on the workbench. We'll open it up. We'll take a look inside. And then I'll come back and tell you how I thought it sounded. Well, here we are. We're going to take a look at the insides of the IEMA A70 Mono. And just for your information, there are four screws in each of the corners on the back panel, two screws on the bottom, and you do need to remove the knobs and then undo these 10 millimeter nuts. So I've got one disassembled. I'm going to cut away and we're going to come back to it. Once you get the unit disassembled, there's the faceplate and the legs that the screws in the back go into. You're looking at the interior, so I'm going to zoom in here. There's some interesting stuff going on in here, um, and I wanted to point that out to you guys. Well, here we are looking at the inside of the IEMA A70 Mono. As you can see, it's pretty well laid out. The Rubicon capacitors, some WEMA caps, swappable op amps. So let's talk about what this is. Um, it does use the TI... Uh, 3255 amp chip, which is on the bottom here under that heat sink. And of course, being a mono, you've got one chip to do the entire signal, which means it's very powerful. It does come stock with TINE 5532 op amps, but you can roll them. And I've tried the OPA 2604s and the OPA, the Burr Brown uh, NOS OPA 2134s with good results. I left the factory ones in here for my listening tests, obviously, just to make it fair so you know what you're getting when it comes out of the box. So one of the interesting things about this technology that they're using called PFFB or post filter feedback technology, in a class D amplifier, it refers to a feedback mechanism where the feedback signal is taken after the output filter instead of before it. So the output signal is modulated as a high frequency pulse train. 
which is passed through a low pass filter, the output filter, to extract the audio signal. The benefits of it are improved accuracy. It compensates for speaker impedance. Have you ever seen a impedance plot of a speaker, you know it's all over the place. Um, and so what can happen is, as the speaker impedance varies with frequency, it can affect the performance of the output filter. With PFFB, obviously the ampl amplifier can compensate for this, and it results in more consistent performance across the varying loads and different frequencies that the speaker is trying to reproduce. It also means lower distortion. So by including the filter in the feedback loop, the post-filter feedback circuitry can reduce distortion particularly at higher frequencies where traditional feedback systems struggle. So obviously with Class D amplifiers, I switch at a very high speed. So having that post-filter feedback loop really Im improves that and makes the sound quality great. And we're going to talk about that when we go back in the studio. It also offers better damping control. So it allows the ampl amplifier to have much better control over the speaker's movement, especially in the bass region, which of course we know Class D amplifiers are really, really good. So this does lead to good, tight, controlled bass frequencies, and I can verify that. And of course, we'll talk about that when we get to the studio. It also means the amplifier is more stable, and that's really an important thing. Um, you know, stability is important when you're driving low impedance loads, especially when you have speakers that sometimes drop well below four ohms. Now, this is stable into two ohms, but I don't know that you'd want to run it at two ohms all the time. So really, with the post-filter feedback circuitry in this Class D amplifier, it improves sound quality by compensating for inaccuracies caused by the output filter and varying speaker impedance. It leads to more linear performance, reduced distortion, and obviously very, very excellent sound quality. So overall, the A70 Mono, it's a really elegant, compact design. It's versatile. Um, it has an enhanced function, and I'll talk about it when we look at the back panel. A 6 dB gain boost for the RCA inputs because obviously balance is a higher voltage. And it does have and I'll show you on the back, and I think I showed it to you once already, it does have a subwoofer output with base management. So that's a really neat feature. So again, I did swap op amps. I did have good results with the 2134s and the 2604s, but I left the stock op amps in there, uh, obviously for review reasons. So let me button this back up. Let's go in the studio. And we'll talk about how it sounds. Well, as you can see from looking inside, they're actually well put together using good quality components. I thought the layout was really, really nice. The swappable op amp is really interesting, and I did swap op amps, but for my review listening, I left the stock op amps in because I want you guys to know how it sounds stock. Not everybody's going to want to roll op amps, and honestly, if I was going to be using these every day, you know, like I have, I probably wouldn't roll the op amps. They sounded really good with the stock uh, NE5532s in it. So that was never an issue for me. I did test it a couple of different ways. For preamps, I did use the Sparkos Gemini, which is a tube based, it has a tube buffer in it. And that was a very good combination. I mean, Class D amplifiers, these have are very clean, very neutral sounding. And the, the Gemini added a little bit of warmth, which is kind of in my wheelhouse for sound quality wise. It was very, very pleasing. For the lion's share of the reviewing, however, I did use my Cambridge Evo 150, the pre-out on it, and I used it as a pre-amplifier. And that is a super fast, super clean, very high resolution unit to begin with. And so I was giving these an absolutely marvelous signal to perform on, and they quitted themselves quite well. So I used the Evo most of the time. Now for speakers, I used primarily the ELAC DVR-62s, um, stand mount speakers, which was a very good combination. and. and really excellent. And that would be, you know, those are not that expensive in a, in a budget with this and those, or even another pair of like the new ELAC debut 3.0s, that would be really a good combination, I think. But for the lion's share of my listening, I did use the Neil Blanchard Design MLTL6 um, transmission line stand mount speakers. And they're I don't think they're difficult to drive, but I think they're demanding to drive because they can, I think their tuning frequency on the transmission line is, is below 30 hertz. So they can dig deep. So how did these do? Um, they did okay. I used this recording from Mindy Bar called In Hi-Fi Stereo, and I had to. I love the album cover on this. If you look in the lower right-hand corner, it's like the old Columbia high stereophonic you know, logo down there in the, in the lower right-hand corner, and I love that. Mindy Bar is, is a saxophonist. She's a band leader. She's very well-regarded session musician. She's worked with Keb Moe and Dave Koz, uh, Gerald Albrecht, Richard Elliott, The Gap Band, Adam Sandler, John Tesh, Tina Marie, She's even featured on Backstreet Boy recordings. Um, she's got a good 
very good tone to her saxophone. It can be gritty if you want to, but it can be just as smooth as honey if she, she wants it to be. She also has got a great voice for singing, a little bit gritty, a little bit very characterful. And this is a very excellent studio album. It's recorded in 2010. Just very well recorded, very well done, good bass, good everything. All the instruments were, re were well recorded and very well reproduced. Um, so very, very pleasing on that. And it's kind of that it's not smooth jazz. It's maybe a little bit jazzier than smooth jazz. I guess that's the way I would put it. Now, to get a little rock and roll going and to kind of return to my roots of prog rock, I use this recording from Steve Hackett called Beyond the Shrouded Horizon. It's from 2011, and it's a really good uh, album, and it is a prog rock album, no question about it. His guitar work is outstanding. Now, Steve was... Uh, the one of the guitarists in Genesis up until I think Lamb Lies Down in Broadway in 74, 75. And when Peter Gabriel left Genesis, I think Hackett left it around the same time as well. And then went on a solo career and he's got a million records out there. And, um, really, really great performer, great guitarist, just an excellent guitarist. And this is a very much a prog rock album. So it's got all of those wonderful, big sweeping kind of soundscapey sort of themes to it his guitar soaring through it obviously there's drive to it obviously there's softness to it it's a really great album i really had a great time listening to it it's been a while since i heard it now that these did very well with that um now to do a little bit more of that symphonic thing i use this recording from sir john barbaroli and the bbc orchestra um it is beethoven's symphony number no. three opus 55 Erica or heroic. And the interesting thing about this, John Baraboli is a very intense, very passionate Beethoven interpreter. It's one of his specialities. Um, and he does an excellent job and he gets the orchestra very much involved and, and it's just a very energetic performance. Let me put it that way. Um, very, very good. But the curious thing about this particular recording was done in 1968. It was recorded in the Free Trade Hall in Manchester, England. And as you can see from the pictures, the Free Trade Hall is a very old building. And I think it was designed for kind of maybe before the turn of the century, you know, in, in, the, in the late 19th century, early 20th century. Um, it was probably designed for music hall kinds of performances. That's why it looks kind of like a bowling alley. But it, it has a square stage. So when you put an orchestra on it, it's not that normal kind of fan-shaped orchestral seating arrangement. It's a bit different. And the imaging is different because of that. And I used it because it can be a little bit hard to pull that sort of unique uh, seating arrangement out of a recording. And these did an okay job. Uh, not the best I've heard, but they did a, a, a very fair job. Um, and it very good. The high frequency, all the frequencies were done. There are some limitations on this because it was recorded in 68. Um, but typically at that point, you know, especially when you're, when you're dealing with like, um, this is a Warner Brothers, so it's probably originally an EMI. Um, they're very good engineers, you know, very good at setting up mics on the stage and things like that. So it is a good recording. There are a bit of a few limitations, maybe on high frequency, um, but these did a great job with it. So talking about the imaging, good center image, good width, never really got much beyond the, the width of the speakers. Um, good depth, decent, uh, you know, uh, good height, not the last word in any of it, but again, taking this in, in, in its proper uh, placement in the market. This and a good DAC with a variable output, I think is a better buy than a you know standalone stereo receiver or standalone integrated amplifier from a mass market uh, company that could cost two times as much as this and a DAC, these and a DAC. Um, and you could pair them with the ELAC DVR-62 has worked really well. They're maybe a little bit more expensive than what you might want to do, but the new ELAC Debut 3.0s, that would be a great pairing. Um, some of the entry-level Polk speakers, um, maybe, uh, I, you know, everybody wants to go on about the Sony SSCS5s. I don't, I'm not a fan of that speaker, but you could, it would be an okay pairing. Um, but I think you could do better than that. You know, maybe um, the, uh, you know, the entry-level caps like the Q, Q350s or Q150s, whatever they are. They're like $350, $400 a pair. That would be a good combination. These did quite well. I'm very pleased. Good bass, good mid-range, very smooth mid-range. And that's a, that was the curious thing is for me, a lot of Class D amplifiers in this kind of category tend to be very strident and thin through the mid-range and into the treble. And I think this PFFB positive filter feedback circuitry takes that edge off and makes it just very neutral, very smooth, 
good detail, good resolution, good dynamics. It was very, very pleasing. And like I said, the value proposition on this, in my mind, is quite good. Um, you know, the other thing you can do with these, and this is uh, manufacturers suggest this, and I certainly do as well. Let's say you have one of these AVR receivers that might have been five, six hundred dollars. You know, they claim to be seventy-five watts by two. Yeah, okay, but then you drive all five or seven channels, and it's not. It's maybe forty-five watts by that total power output. Well, if you wanted more power, what you could do is you could use the main channels of that amplifier to drive your main speakers. And maybe the center, because usually they'll do all right with that. And then use a, a handful of these things to drive your surround speakers, and you'll get much better performance. You're not going to be putting as much load on the amplifier, so the, the dynamics will be far improved. Because, again, the amplifier is only dealing with either the front speakers or the front and the center speakers. And you'll get much better performance out of it doing it that way. So this would be a great way to do that. And of course, with the individual volume, you can level match a lot easier that way. Most AV receivers have the ability to put a test tone through everything and you get a little dB meter on your phone and you could set the volume so that all the channels are all equal. It would be a great way to do it in a very inexpensive way without you know, redoing the entire kit and caboodle. So anyway. The IEMA A70 Monos, I like these. They're, I was very pleased with their performance, and, and I was a bit surprised. I mean, IEMA built some good stuff. I have an A07 I've been using on my desktop for years, um, and it's pleasant for that. These were better than pleasant. I was, they were very, very rewarding to listen to. So anyway, I babbled on long enough. If you like the video, please give me a like and a subscribe. I'd appreciate that. If you want to support the video, there is a thank you button at the bottom of the video window. There's also a membership link in the pinned comment and in the video description. In the video description will be uh, affiliate links for these. There are also affiliate links for a lot of other products I use and, and have reviewed. Um, there's my playlist in there. Um, you guys have been sending me playlists. Please continue to do so. Please check out the community post for some wonderful music there. Um, please comment. Let me know what you think. Let me know if you're in the market for this. Are you starting out? Do you need a second system? What is it you're trying to do? I think these give you a lot of flexibility and they do a really good job. You know, one thing I failed to mention was, and this was a big deal for me, their power supplies, it's a GAN FET or GAN gallium nitrate power supply, it is much smaller than the regular size. They're much easier to accommodate behind equipment, really. So shout out for that. Anyway, that derailed the entire review. <laughs> like, subscribe, comment, follow me on Instagram. Thank you so much. My name is Ed Homewood. This is the Old Guy Hi-Fi channel saying now, it's your turn to go listen to some wonderful music, maybe on a cool little set of monoblock class D amplifiers. Thanks again. I appreciate it. Have a wonderful day. Bridging past and pressing in the glow of autumn light. He holds the future gently.